Hey guys, Patrick here from Specifics Prep. Today we're going to do something kind of fun. I'm going to take a test and you're going to watch me. Now this is a recent SAT and I'm going to be doing the non-calculator section. Uh, I'll stick to the medium and the difficult questions and I'm going to think aloud as I solve the questions and what I want you to pay attention to is how a good test taker moves through the SAT. What sorts of features of the questions do I pay attention to? Um, how do I use the difficulty of the question to my advantage? Um, what sorts of techniques and tools do I consistently go back to to make the questions easier to understand? And uh, just how difficult the math itself actually is on these questions. You're going to find that for most of these questions, the math is not what makes the questions difficult. It's the psychology of the questions. It's the way they're uh, posed. It's the way they ask you um, to do unusual things with math that you're generally pretty comfortable with. So uh, the test is freely available online. The link is in the description. So go ahead and follow the link, print the test out if you want to work along with me. And uh, when possible, I will try to solve the question more than one way so you can see that there are um, oftentimes many legitimate ways to get the correct answer. If you have any questions, feel free to comment on this video and we'll get back to you soon as soon as possible. Shall we? All right. As I mentioned, we're going to start at number eight because we're going to avoid the lower difficulty questions. Eight says, in the air, the speed of sound S is meters per second is a linear function of the air temperature t in degrees Celsius and is given by s of t equals 0.6 t plus 331.4 which the following statements is the best interpretation of the number 331.4 now this question comes up a ton on the SAT that is do you know how linear functions work so I'm sure you've seen uh, y equals mx plus b before now we got the y-intercept uh, the y um, variable, which is, we generally refer to as the output of a function. Uh, the x is usually the input. The b is the y-intercept. And the m is the slope. Let's go that. Okay. Um, now, the question will always basically ask which one of these four things, um, what each of these four things mean in the context of the story that they're told. Uh, they're telling. So uh, y-intercept is generally where things start. Uh, so you know you, you usually plot out the y-axis, uh, the y-intercept on the x-y-axis and uh, you start at zero whatever. So that's the y-intercept. That's what they're asking about here. So the y-intercept is right here, the 3 through 1.4, which means that that's the value of the output of the function is the y before uh, the x starts to contribute any change, that is when x is zero. So in this case, 3 through 1.4 is the speed when the temperature is zero, which just so happens to be answer choice A. Now, if you wanted to, you could go ahead and graph this, uh, uh, you know, draw the graph of this, and you would see that it starts at 3 through 1.4 and it goes up 0.6 for every increase in T. But, um, you know, don't need to do all that for this question. Right, on to number nine. System of equations, y equals x squared, 2y plus 6 equals 2 times x plus 3. xy is the solution of the system of equation above, and x is greater than 0, which is the value of xy. So two things to pay attention here. First, x is greater than 0 suggests there may be more than one solution. And x asking for the value of xy, which means that you may need to solve directly for the value of xy, as opposed to solving for x and then solving for y and then uh, solving for uh, the product xy. So let's see what we got here. We have y defined in terms of x, so y equals x squared, and then we have a second equation with both an x and a y in it. My first instinct on this question would be to do substitution, and that is substitute in x squared for y. So let's give that a shot. And 2 times x squared, again replacing the y with x squared, plus 6 equals 2 times x plus 3. Now the nice thing about this is we have one equation, one variable which we can solve. It looks like it's going to be a quadratic that we'll have to factor, but uh, we've done that before. So let's simplify and get uh, like terms combined. So again, we'll simplify the right-hand side of the equation first. 2x plus 6. Uh, the 6's cancel out. And if we had 2x squared equals 2x, we get divide both sides by 2. And we get x squared equals x. Now, there are two solutions to this, right? There is 0 and there's 1. 
but they tell us that x is greater than 0, so the only answer to this is x equals 1. So now we know the value of x, we can find the value of y by going back to one of these equations. And we can put 1 into either one of these equations, but it'd be kind of crazy to use the second one when the first one's so easy. So we know that, that y is equal to 1 as well, so the product xy is equal to 1. Did this get correct? Alright, number 10. A squared plus B squared equals Z, and AB equals Y, what's the following equivalent to uh, for Z plus 8Y? Okay, this looks like, again, it's going to be a substitution question. So I'm going to write down what they give me, uh, whether I want me to solve for at the bottom. So 4Z plus 8Y. Now again, substitution uh, shows up a lot on the SAT, so let's give that a shot. So. I know that z equals a squared plus b squared, so 4 times a squared plus b squared. I know that 8 equals, I'm sorry, y equals a b, so we have 8 a b. So we just substitute for y and for z. Uh, let's distribute and simplify. So we have 4 a squared plus 4 b squared, just using distribution, uh, plus 8 a b. Now this looks like a quadratic. Again, if we reorder the terms, it might be a little easier to see. So we have 4a squared plus 8ab plus 4b squared. And uh, I know my common quadratics, and I know that if I have um, x plus y squared, it's a common quadratic, I get x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. And it looks very similar to what we're dealing with here. Instead of two and uh, one and two as the coefficients, we're dealing with four and eight. So chances are pretty good that it's going to be some version of this that is something that looks like x plus y squared in the, in the parentheses. Uh, so we could look at the answer choices, and we could just evaluate the first term just to see what would happen if we foiled each one, right? So we'd have um, uh, a times a is a squared. It's going to be a squared. We need four a squared, so it's not going to be this. And then same thing with c, we have 4a, if we squared that, 4a times 4a, if we foiled, we get 16a squared, so that's not that, that's not that, which means that we you know this. And we could try this out just to be sure, For uh, foil first would be 4a squared, and the two middle terms would be 4ab and 4ab, which would add up to 8ab, and then 4b squared. That's exactly what we have here, so these are the answer. On to the next page. Find the right circular cylinder, A is 22 cubic centimeters, what is the volume in cubic centimeters of the right circular cylinder with twice the radius and half the height of cylinder A? So this is another one that's pretty common, pretty common question type on the SAT. They ask you how changing one or two of the variables, the values of the variables, uh, change the final outcome, the final result. Uh, so let's get the formula for volume of a cylinder up there first. So the volume of a cylinder is just the area of the base, which is a circle, so pi r squared times the height. If you don't remember this, this uh, equation is given to you at the beginning of the math section. Now they tell us that the volume of cylinder A, so I'll do volume of A, is 22 cubic centimeters. And again, that equals pi r squared h. All students get frustrated here because they don't know either r or h, and normally you get one or the other, um, but in this case they're not giving you either. However, they're asking you how the volume would change if you had another cylinder with twice the radius and half the height. So we'll call this the volume of B, cylinder B, right? Uh, and we are going to say that we're changing the radius by doubling it, right? So instead of r, we're going to have 2r. Now it's important to put the entire thing in parentheses because we're doubling the radius and then we're applying it to the equation. And then half the height. Okay, so this we could simplify a bit. We do v equals 4r squared times pi times 1 half h. So we can combine these uh, constants, these coefficients, so 4 times 1 half is 2. I'm going to put this on the outside just so it's a little easier to see. And make sure you can still see my work here. There you go. Um, so it would be 2, the 4 times 1 half, times pi r squared h. Now, a lot of students can get to this point and not know what to do, 
But because I've written things down, I know that pi squared h, pi r squared h is 22. So this entire thing right here is equal to 22. So it's, the question is really just asking what's 2 times 22? And that's an easy question. 44. Yeah, we're done. Alright, number 12. So the is equivalent to 9 raised to the 3 fourths power. Fractional exponents, again, are very scary for most students. Just remember that when you're dealing with a fractional exponent, the denominator is going to be the index of the root. So in this case, it would be the fourth root. And then the numerator is just um, the power that you're raising this to. So it would be 9 cubed. You could write the cubed on the outside of the radical too. So you could also write it like this. The fourth root of the square root, uh, the fourth root of the the square root of here. Fourth root of nine cubed. They're equivalent expressions. You can write it either way, whatever's easier. I think I prefer this way for this one just because what the heck is the fourth root of nine? Um, but in this case, you can see that you can start to compare to the answer choices. We know that's not the fourth root of not nine, so we can get rid of b. We know it's not the cube, doesn't look like it's gonna be the cube root of nine, so we can leave that. But we should also just start thinking about how we can rewrite this so we can get a 3 out of the radical. Now, 9 is 3 squared, right? So we can rewrite 9 as 3 squared cubed. So we just replace the 9 with a 3 squared. I like doing this, getting it down to its uh, sort of most reduced form, just because it makes uh, evaluating the exponents a lot easier. So we get the fourth root of 3 to the sixth. Now, we could take four of these six threes out, so that would come out as one three, and then we'd have the fourth root of three squared, which already suggests that it's going, not going to be C, because there's no three on the outside, um, and suggests that it's not going to be A either, but we can confirm, just to be sure, we can turn this back into a fractional exponent, so we do three raised to the three times three to raise to the, again, the two is going to be the numerator and the four is going to be the denominator. And that's three to the one half. So that equals three times three to the one half. And that equals three root three. Interesting. And number 11. In a restaurant, n cups of tea are made by adding tea tea bags to hot water. If t equals n plus 2, how many additional tea bags are needed to make each additional cup of tea? Alright, so sometimes when they're using weird uh, letters uh, in our linear functions, I like to write off to the side what these letters stand for. So n is cups of tea. And t is tea bags. Could be more specific. I could say number of cups of tea and number of tea bags, but uh, there's no ambiguity here. Now, if you remember what we talked about with number 8, this is also just a linear function question. So t is the output, it's the uh, t bags, uh, and it's a function of the number of cups of tea that I want to make, so n plus 2. So, the question is asking how many additional t bags are needed to make each additional cup of tea. This is kind of a weird question, it's hard to visualize. A lot of students are leaning towards 2 because the 2's here. But if we plot this on the xy axis, where n is the horizontal axis and t is the vertical axis, Let's see, they start with 2, and then for each additional t bag, we need one cup of t, right? It's 1 to 1 because the slope is 1. So if we graph this, it would just be the equivalent of y equals x plus 2, right? I'm a good drawer. Anyway, um, this question is just asking for the slope of this line in a very convoluted way. So this is a slope question, uh, which, believe it or not, is all that's required to know on this question. So what's the slope of this uh, line? It is, so for each additional cup of tea, you need one additional tea bag, or for each additional tea bag, you need one additional cup of tea. Uh, I kind of hate this question because it makes no sense. This function doesn't make any sense. It suggests that if you want to make, if you have zero tea bags, you can still make two cups of tea. I don't get it. Or zero cups of tea, you need two tea bags. I don't know. It's stupid. It also makes really strong tea if you only want one cup of tea. Anyway, um, 
your own cup of tea, you need three tea bags? It doesn't make any sense. Anyway, another way to do this question would just be to try out some numbers. You could say, let's see how many um, tea bags I need for one cup of tea. So when n equals one, we know that uh, t equals n plus two, so t would equal three, right? So one cup of tea, three tea bags. Very strong tea. Now, the question is saying I want to make one additional cup of tea, so if I change n to two, what would t change to? Well, put two into the equation, we get t equals four. So the question is asking how many more tea bags we need that went from three to four, which is also just an increase of one. So that's another way to do this question. Number 14. Function if f of x equals 2 to the x plus 1, the function f is defined by the equation above, which the following is the graph of y equals negative f of x in the xy plane. Now, if you knew what 2 to the x plus 1 um, looks like, you could just flip it over the x axis, applying this transformation, um, and answer the question. However, I suspect that most students don't know what this function looks like off the top of their head. So I think this is a very really good candidate for just writing out a table of values. So we're gonna make this a slightly enriched table of values by we're gonna figure out the normal uh, x and f of x, and then we're gonna add a column for negative f of x, which is what we're solving for. So I'll do x, f of x, and negative f of x. And since the window here seems to go from about negative three to positive three in both directions, we'll do negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two, just to be safe. All right, so plug negative two into this real equation. Two to the negative two is one over two squared, or one over four, uh, and plus one would be five fourths. And if we're gonna do the negative, it would be negative five fourths. If you want to do decimals, that's fine too, 1.25. Uh, two to the negative one would be one half, plus one would be three halves. This would be the negative three halves. See how easy this is? Here's where a lot of students make a mistake. They assume that because this is uh, one, that the y-intercept is going to be one, but two to the zero is actually one. So one plus one is two, which would make this negative two. Now, I probably have enough points now to uh, answer the question, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going just to be safe. All right, so two to the first is two, plus one is three, negative three, and two squared is nine, plus one is 10, negative 10. Okay, looks like we have our values. So looking for a negative two positive five fourths is too big, this is negative. And then we have C, oh sorry, we don't need, <laughs> negative five fourths. Um, so that's positive, and that's positive, we get rid of that one. So we have, and then negative one, negative three halves, that looks good. Two, negative two, I'm sorry, zero, negative two. Uh, then one, negative three, yep. Sorry, all right. This one's tough, 15. Okay, Alan drives an average of 100 miles each week. His car can travel an average of 25 miles per hour, I'm sorry, 25 miles per gallon of gasoline. I would like to reduce his weekly Expenditure on gasoline by five dollars. Assuming gasoline costs four dollars per gallon, which equation can Alan use to determine how much, how many fewer average miles M he could should drive each week? So this one's weird because it's not asking you to find the actual number of miles fewer he should drive. It's just what equation could you use? So there are two ways I think you can answer this. You can figure out what M would be and then figure out which answer choice gives you that value of M. That is actually answer the question: How many fewer miles must he drive? And then figure out which of these answer choices gives you that number. Or we can really focus on units here because it's really, uh, that's the challenging part. So um, his car drives 25 miles per gallon, right? So if we write that as a fraction and put the units on it, it'd be 25 miles in one gallon, right? Uh, he, wants to ex he wants to reduce the expense by $5. So $5, again, the unit is dollars. And then assuming gasoline costs $4 per gallon. So four dollars per one gallon. Which equation can you use to determine how many fewer miles he should drive each week? So because he wants to save five miles, we want the output of this equation to be five, where m is the number of miles. So again, m is going to be in 
the unit of miles. And you'll see why I'm focusing so much on the units in a second. All right, so um, we know that we want it to be $5, right? So we want the unit on the right-hand side to be dollars, which means that we need the unit on the left-hand side of the equation to be dollars as well. So what would happen if we multiplied miles over gallons times dollars over gallons? Well, we get mile gallons over gallons squared. That's no good, right? We don't want that. Uh, we want dollars in the numerator, so we're going to keep four this way, but we're going to flip um, 25 miles over one gallon. We're going to make it one gallon over 25 miles. It's the same fraction, it's the same ratio, it's just in a more usable form because when we put four dollars over one gallon and we multiply that by one gallon over 25 miles and then we multiply that by m which we already said is in miles the gallons are going to cross out the miles are going to cross out and we're just left with four over 25 times m so the, do the dollar is the only unit that uh, is uh, left behind, so 4 over 25 dollars times m is going to equal 5, which is d. Make sense? Just going to focus on the units for a question like this. That wasn't so bad, right? The point of this exercise was not to show you how awesome I am at taking the SAT, although I am awesome at taking the SAT. The point of this is to show you what a good test taker does. Uh, that is, even if you don't know how to solve a question immediately, there are some fundamental skills that will increase the likelihood that you'll see the solution. First thing that I did that I want to point out is I read each question in its entirety before I started working. That's really important. That was not just for your benefit. It's really important to read through each question before you start working on it so you know all the information and you know what you're solving for. The second is I wrote everything down. I used my pencil, uh, pen in this case, uh, to um, document the information that was in the question and help me make sense of it. A lot of students keep everything in their heads and that uh, requires sort of tying up your cognitive abilities um, when you can just sort of offload that information onto the paper and free your brain up to work on solving the question. Um, the third thing I did was I paid a lot of attention to the difficulty of the question. Even though some questions looked like they were straightforward, I knew that I was in the difficult section, so I went with a thoughtful solution as opposed to the most obvious straightforward solution for each question. Fourth thing I did was I fell back to uh, a consistent sort of set of uh, tools that work really well on the test. You see that for two of the questions, uh, I just need to know how slope intercept works. And for two of the questions, I just need to know how to use substitution. And that's not unusual for hard questions. Is a lot of the questions fall apart using the same sort of consistent set of tools. Um, so getting good at a core set of competencies is really important to do well on the SAT. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you have any other uh, questions, feel free to comment. If you want to see me solve a different test that's out there, uh, or even a specific question, just again, comment on the video. And I look forward to working with you. Thanks.